Yeah, okay. It's nice to see uh, some Makokata acquaintances of uh, 30 and 40 years uh, duration here tonight. That was a nice surprise. So I'm just going to be talking about sharpening. Um, I'll just do a little brief review of metals. I'm not a professional on this, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but I'm just going to hit metals, um, the abrasives you might be using for sharpening, and then just reviewing uh, sharpening, uh, platform sharpening, the V-arm with gouges, and uh, free sharpening. And a few other little tidbits, I think. So um, just on the, on the metals, um, I just wanted to talk for a second on, on common steel. Um, and you know, steel is, when it's manufactured and you see the large molten vats, you know, they, they pour it out, it's quenched, and when it hardens, it, that, uh, that heated steel that, that gets uh, quenched and hardened uh, ends up just getting uh, incredibly, uh, incredibly hard from the quenching, but it's very, very brittle. And so then the process is that uh, steel is, um, is uh, then uh, tempered, and that's with a very, very low heat, right? Okay, and that gives us its strength and its structure. So the main thing about just regular you know, steel is that it loses its temper at about 200 degrees. So it doesn't take much for common steel either in use or on a grinder to, if it turns blue or any color, then it's lost its temper, it's lost its, um, its, its strength and its endurance. So for that reason, I, you know, there just isn't, there aren't a lot of turning tools that are used, that are made out of, made out of steel. I'm just not gonna talk anymore about steel, but um, just go into a bit on the high speed steel. It is interesting, uh, so you know, high speed steel basically is steel with other metals added into it, primarily tungsten. Tungsten is incredibly hard. And um, other steels are put in, uh, other, sorry, other metals are put in with the steel, uh, molybdenum and that one, I, that's, that resists corrosion and vanade, uh, vanadium, right, is, um, that one's actually more malleable like copper. So those, and you know, then there, there are various other ones, but the primary one in high-speed steel that really gives it the, the, um, the advantage is the tungsten. And, um, and apparently the tungsten itself does not blend that great with the steel. It isn't like you put it in a pot of soup and you, you know, heat it up and mix it together and you pour it out. Uh, the tungsten is in kind of you know, chunks in a sense and it's put together with the steel under high pressure and heat. And I know when I first got some of my first uh, high speed tools English tool, they talked about it being rolled steel. Well, I think that, yeah, rolled with the tungsten and the steel and high pressure and heat, that's how they, you know, that's how they manufacture it. So um, that's the, the, the thing with the high speed steel is it, it basically um, is, a, is a lot harder than regular steel. And then the big advantage is it doesn't um, lose its temper, it doesn't lose its character. Um, uh, until you get a lot higher heat, 700 degrees, it can take 800 to 1,000 degrees without losing its, its uh, structural capacity. So that's the real advantage. Um, so we can sharpen it you know, on the sharpeners um, with, without ruining it, usually. Still got to be careful. Um, I think a take home for the sharpening, we'll see here the high speed steel when it comes off these, when sparks come off the grinders, they're, they're orange and uh, individual sparks, as opposed to regular metal that's going to be probably white and maybe more explosive, flashy. So you'll see when you're sharpening, um, you're looking for the orange, uh, orange uh, sparks. Um, so... Um, then the next upgrade that, oh, by the way, um, well, okay. So um, the next upgrade then that kind of 
you know, took place, has taken place um, in the high-speed steel is uh, the is the upgrade to the to the PM, the particulate material or powdered metal. And so what they what they've done is they they take the steel and the tungsten and the other metals, and uh, I'm going to say chop them up. Okay, uh, don't ask me how they do it. But they're they're basically partitioned up into m much uh, smaller particles. And so, like the tungsten, instead of being in bigger chunks and much finer par uh, particles, they still have to do the same thing: uh, high degree of pressure and high temperature to put it together. But the uh, smaller particles uh, have created a, uh, an even tougher, stronger, high-speed steel. So the PMs, um, particle metal, um, or powder metal, or particle metal. Um, some of the other brands will have um, 20, they'll have the, well, the 30 or 60 designation, and that, that, those are also, also usually particle metal tools, and they kind of um, are similar to like the Crown's PM, you know, brand as far as hardness and that. There are some different levels of that. So that's the upgrade uh, with um, powder, the uh, PM, high-speed steel PMs. Um, Cryo is an interesting one. I just happened to buy at you know one of the national conferences, uh, and occasionally a Cryo cryo done tool I think I have one down here somewhere so in the in the cooling process um, of the high-speed steel they can actually take it to a, a an extremely cold you know temperature uh, uh, ultra cold temperature and that also changes the um, configuration and the structure of the high-speed steel in a similar manner that um, that these other techniques do and uh, will make it harder like your PMs. So some of the same changes can they can do by ultra cooling it. So you'll see some cryo treated high speed steels and those are going to be harder also. Uh, so the high, the high speed steels basically are sharp, high heat resistant, High impact toughness, so it prevents chips and breaks. Um, high wear resistance. Strength to maintain cutting forces. Okay. So the other um, material that we see in cutters, um, in, in our tools that we use typically, is are the carbides. How many have carbide inserts, right? Okay, actually quite a few people. Okay, so we've got carbide inserts that go on. and um, So the carbide is really fascinating. Um, carbides are basically, um, car carbide itself is not a metal. Carbide ha it typically uses tungsten, which is extremely hard. And um, then has has the has a carbon compound with it so basically carbides are um, um, are a metal and a compound of carbon so what's a compound of carbon well for example um, diamonds are their carbon that's a, that's a carbon base that was made two and three billion years ago at really really high pressures uh, in, the, in the earth's early formation so those are actually carbon compounds. They aren't, they aren't metal. So uh, carbon compounds are made and they are put together with uh, metals, typically tungsten, to make your, your carbide. So the car carbide is really a, a compound, two things, carbon and metal. It's, uh, I, I think I did read, and it, it, it's helpful for me, it's similar to uh, gravel, in cement to make concrete. So if you get a bag of um, cement, it's got gravel in there, it's got Portland cement. The Portland cement is like your, when you put water in there, is like your um, 
your, your metal, you're, you're heated it up, it's metal, and the carbon compounds are like the gravel. That's what carbides are like. Um, so the, the carbon is just unbelievably hard. Is, that's where the hardness comes from. Being able to keep them, get them sharp, that's more of a metal, that's more of a tungsten metal character. Uh, so the one, you know, issue with this compound, you got these carbon things with the, with the metal, the tungsten, uh, there is more brittleness. Because you have carbon that's kind of glued and cemented together in a, in a tungsten base. It's, it's just e more easily fragmented. And I mean, I can, I can tell you myself, you know, I've got at least five carbide tip table saw blades, and they're all, all the, all the, you know, blades are chipped off of them. The carbide tips are gone, right? They break off. So that's one thing that happens with, um, with the carbide. Um, but the carbide is, you know, just really, really hard. It lasts a long time. Um, okay. Uh, wheels. I'm just going to talk about wheels and abrasives. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot on metal because it could be a totally different topic and we might want someone to talk on that. Maybe we can talk about that later uh, if you want, you know, want to get into that. Um, just on the, on the abrasives. So the major abrasive for the um, high-speed steel tools we use is, is the aluminum oxide. Um, now, it, it actually happens to be a softer and more fragmenting material. You'd think, well, you're going to sharpen these hard tools. You better have something hard. But you look at the Norton site, you know, that makes, um, makes you know, some of the wheels, and they, they, they just describe it. No, they're actually a little softer. They're made to fragment so it doesn't heat up. And um, it's, it's just an interesting little uh, finding. Um, so aluminum oxide, um, a lot of, some of them come with, um, the gray wheels that come with your common grinders are not, to be, you shouldn't use those for high speed steel. Uh, they do have aluminum oxide ones that are made for um, um, high speed steel. Um, I think some of the cheaper um, grinders, the Rikon and the, um, oh, the, I forget the other ones, these ones. They, they'll come with the white um, aluminum oxide, and that does okay. I happen to get my, I've always gotten my wheels from Norton. They have that blue line that's made for high speed steel, but they're aluminum oxide. Um, other abrasives, this is probably a little better if I got this up higher somewhere, wouldn't it? Um, Uh, so then the other abrasives that can be used uh, would be your diamond abrasives. And um, you could probably get a diamond wheel, but I think your diamonds get ground off pretty quickly um, you know, trying something like that. But in wood turning, um, the diamond um, sharpeners are commonly done. And... Um, well, I'll just kind of just go right into that. I, I don't do this a lot myself, but, <clears throat> you know, to kind of put an extra little grind on um, on a tool, if it's dulling down a little bit, you can take a card or a, and, uh, you know, do a little uh, brushing up to um, bring up a little bit better um, edge. Um, the files are used longitudinally, and um, it is it is interesting. Uh, the wood turning magazine, AAW Wood Turning Magazine, quite a few years ago actually had an article on um, you know doing the diamond um, sharpening after after sharpening even on a wheel uh, because there's a little bit of microscopic roughness, and the pictures that they showed did show that the you know after doing a little honing with a um, file on the inside, um, a little flat file on the outside, 
the edges on the microscopic photos were smoother. The cuts on the wood were also smoother, microscopically. Um, and I think you can look that up in the archives if you want. You can, uh, you can take a look at that. I think that the one thing that actually uh, Steve pointed out a long time ago um, uh, at one of these meetings, I, I think it's, it's important for wood carvers probably to get that extra, extra fine edge so that their next, you know, 20 and 30 or 50 cuts are, are you know, sharp. They want to get done what they want to do with the least amount of energy and all that. But with wood turning, if you do that, if you do that and you turn on your lathe and run it for a minute, your, your tool has gone and cut probably a half a mile's worth of wood and any advantage you get on putting a fine edge on there is probably gone in a darn quick hurry. And so I think it's pretty acceptable to, uh, you know, sharpen off of a wheel or a sander and bypass the honing and stuff with a with a diamond file unless you want to get picky about it. So, um, but I just thought I'd bring up the diamond stuff uh, as a component. Um, oh, the last abrasive then is the CBN wheels. Uh, how many folks have gotten CBN wheels? Yeah, the uh, cubic boron nitride. And basically they're just, you know, secondary to um, diamonds for hardness and they last forever and and um, you know so be it um, just uh, general uh, we'll get into the sharpening just a couple things I mentioned the orange uh, sparks um, in order to keep from overheating your tool it's popular to get a slow speed grinder instead of the 3500 rpm you get the 1750 or whatever it is yes Yeah, what grit wheel to use. So um, we'll get into that with a different, I mean, that's a good topic. You know, when I first got into this, um, you know, 15 years ago, some of the old timers, they, you know, they were saying to get, you know, 35 or 60 grit wheels. And, and um, on the aluminum oxides, it seemed like, um, you know, 80 grit um, has been fine, you know, 120. Um, that's that sort of range seems to work fine um, but it's I, I think it you know you can go finer than that also uh, a lot of that has to do with probably how much um, well it does have to do a little bit with tool work and I'll actually mention that with um, with the um, scrapers so I, I don't know, I'm not going to say any special, you know, amount myself, although I'm, I've done fine with uh, 80 and 120 myself. I'm comfortable with that. I actually got a CBN. I figured, okay, and I've made, I've been through several grinders. I made my own at first and doubles and I've got and all that. And, and so I've been through it a lot, it seems. Um, I actually thought last last year, I think for the, um, I got in on the craft supply thing and got myself, I'm gonna get myself a CBN wheel, by golly, you know? And I did, and I swapped it out on this machine. I put it, I got a 180 grit, and I put it right on that machine, and I got one of my tools out and put it on my jig, and it, I've got things finely, as you see, you'll see, very, very finely done. I don't have to make very many adjustments. I um, put my put my gouge on it and run across it and turned off and I looked at it and it just had a lot of vertical striations on it. I didn't push it down very hard or anything and I thought what the hell? That's a 180 grit. It's got all those vertical striations. I said, I don't really I don't know. I don't really need those. What's that about? And um, I kind of pondered over it for a little bit because, by golly, I wanted a CBN wheel. But I did t 
take it off, I gave it to my son-in-law, and I put my old wheel back on. Uh, so it, it wasn't that magical for me. I, it's just my experience, but you know, everybody's got their own thing, and they'll last for a long time, and if it does, does a good job, it does a good job for you, you know? So give it a go, bingo. Um, so those are the, those are the, uh, the abrasives. So orange sparks, um, low speed. Um, now I'll have to admit too, I've, can you hear me okay? Um, I've always had um, one or two regular garage sale grinders with a high speed steel, a good quality wheel on there that I've used for sharpening. And I don't think that I've ever overheated a, tur a tool, but I haven't ground one one for five minutes either. This is just quick sharpening. It does the job and I'm gone. I don't think I've ever, you know, for, for the quick sharpening jobs I've done on those grinders, I think they work fine. I did get a slow speed one here and then I got actually a second one finally. Um, but, um, and then um, we'll talk about it, but um, you've got a platform here and then, uh, there are various forms of the V-arm for your gouges. So let's, um, oh, I think the other thing, just general thing I'll talk about, if you're shaping up a tool from scratch, it, it is, say, and, uh, okay, that's not, I wanna see where this is for a second here. I'll be moving down to here, I think, at some point. Okay, just so I can see this. Um, it is um, it, it isn't a bad thing to think about doing the top profile here first, right here, grinding that. You know, if you're starting out from scratch, and I'll look and see where this one is. Ah, thanks. There we go. Okay. And where are we going to be there? Am I going to be up here? Let's, let's try it for there, and I'll kind of know where it is then. Okay, I'll go down here then. Okay. Did it go back? I'll, I'll catch up with it here. Uh, okay. So uh, you may consider grinding the, the profile here first, the top profile. I'll hold it up right this way. And then take it to the grinder and um, grind the, the bottom up to your profile. It's just something to keep in mind if you're starting from scratch. Just a concept to think about. Uh, okay, so another thing I'll talk about here now is that I'll mention some, maybe some angles for sharpening and things like that. Keeping in mind that um, you can take one tool and sharpen it many different ways for different uses. So if something doesn't match the angle that you're thinking about, and you're saying, what is he thinking about? It's, it's because there are different ways to use the tools. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and actually a tool use talk would be helpful first. And I just got to thinking that um, I was gonna do a tool use talk, do you remember this? And I actually have some of the pieces of wood and I think that got rudely interrupted two years ago with the pandemic probably, and it got canned and we didn't do it. So uh, I'll have a little bit of tool use stuff in here even though it's a full topic on its own. Um, I'm just going to start with, for a second, with um, kind of a freewheeling sharpening with um, just with a parting tool. And um, a parting tool is kind of um, kind of a funny. Actually, before we get into that, I'm going to use these terms, and it probably may not go well here. Okay, I've got this here. Um, I. I'm going to occasionally use the term um, cutter, a cutting tool, and a scraping tool. 
And um, I, people have different definitions of that, which I think they're kind of worthless. I, I use the um, I use the, the pocket knife thing in a grandkid. So um, if you're teaching a grandkid how to cut, if you've got a sharp um, tool to cut, that tool ought to be parallel to the piece of wood you're cutting, going longitudinally, right? So this would be cutting. Kid's going to be able to cut like that. If, you're, if your tool, if your cutting surface is perpendicular to the wood, that's scraping. You need to tell that kid, you're not going to ever cut through that thing. You're scraping it. Turn it down. And to some degree, to some degree, even though this is a sharp, you know, a sharp edge, if it's tilted up and pointing into the, can you see that a bit? Yes. If you're, if you're, if you're, if it's still angling up into the wood, but you're still, it's not a very good cutter there. You're still kind of scraping it. So basically, um, this this is a uh, this this is a cutting tool. If it's held properly, it's a scraping tool. If it's held otherwise, and so um, cutting and scraping, I think, can be made fairly simple uh, in describing it. The the one weird kind of funny thing is that a parting tool, it has really. It's got scraping characteristics in that it's, you know, you're going in perpendicular straight into the wood. Uh, it's really a scraping cut, although you actually commonly catch it on the bevel where it's, 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 it is kind of a cut. So it's sort of a mix between the two, uh, but I consider it more of a scraper. So at any rate, um, this thing's pretty easy. Uh, I don't think there's a great deal of importance in what the angle is that comes back out of this. I've got one that I've rounded off because I put it into the tops of vases and I don't want to get it hung up. Um, and so um, I think there's some different cutting characteristics if it's sharper or shallower. But in fact, I don't even, I don't, I don't pay too much attention about sharpening the, anything but this top edge. Um, maybe every five or ten times I'd cut it, I might take a look and make sure that the curve is coming up nice and pretty, but it isn't all that important as long as there's a nice continuum. So um, when I sharpen up these, I'll kind of give you an idea of the uh, length of time that it takes and how simple it is. Okay, I'm going to be turning here. I shut the lathe off. I want to sharpen it. I'm going to come down. I'm going to kind of free wheel this one on one of them. I guess I'll do it over here. Um, you could put it on a platform, but I, I actually kind of like I, I, I kind of like just free free wheeling it. And I will um, I will touch the base part of this, but really I'm only paying attention to to getting the the sharp edge of it. So. Just to get it started, I'm going to touch on the touch on the the heel down here, and then pretty quickly run up. And when I see orange sparks coming over the top, it's done. That's all there is to it. Turn the lathe back on. And I start turning. That, that's it. I typically only sharpen one edge of this, and then um, I usually sharpen only one edge because I think, as we see with the scrapers and that, you end up the other way just grinding over the shape that you made and the little burr on the end. You don't really gain anything. 
I've tried this both ways, and the last one that, typically the last one I've turned is, is the sharpest one, and that's what I want to stick with. So just this last year, after 15 years of turning, I, uh, I sharpen um, just on one surface, then I put a little piece of tape uh, on the back on, on my upside. That's what I use. And the next time I might go on the other side, and maybe not. But that's pretty easy. Any questions on that? Um, we'll have lots of time for questions and reviews later. Uh, let's just go into let's go into the scrapers. Um, <laughs> here we go. So, this big thing here, who, uh, is anybody at the club here when, who's the fellow that worked at the grocery store who had lots of, he was always getting stuff off the internet. He came in with a handful of these high speed steel pieces and anybody want them, you know, is it like $10 a piece? And I said, well, sure, yeah, I'll take it and uh, grabbed it. <laughs> he was always finding deals for us. Um, so, scrapers, um, Presumably, and I, I think it is true, the real um, work that it does for uh, on, on the lathe is from the burr that's left at the top after you've had it on the wheel. So when it's been on a wheel, the wheel's going around this way. Um, sorry, it's coming down this way. You would expect... You know, you expect a bigger burr on the bottom, but there actually is a burr on the top also. And I can feel that actually here with my finger. So it's really the burr on top that does the work. And because of that, I, I think the adage that I've thought of here is when you sharpen a scraper, you're not sharpening it. You're just bringing up a burr. Um, I, and then I think another thing to think about is this, uh, is this angle. This base just has to be out of your way because most people are going to do a negative rake use of that scraper. It's going to be tilted down anyway. That base is way out of the way. You really don't have to have, I don't think there's that much difference in, in the angle here, you know, within a certain range. I think that some folks want to, get these to work better and better and they'll make them pretty pretty sharp bevel I think that can make it more grabby that's my opinion I think you're making a more grabby tool you don't want it to gra be grabby you want it to scrape so it's it's a smooth you know finish so I, I just have this feeling I don't know that you shouldn't really put an acute angle on the bevel just get it out of the way and then again you're um, Sharp, you know. Don't worry about making it sharp like that to make it work better, because you just want to. You just want a, a bevel. So um, this one's another one that um, it's pretty easy. So I'm. Um, I, I will end up. Well, I'll, I, I'm turning on my lathe. <clears throat> it's time to sharpen it. I'm going to come around, and. Um, This, on, on this lathe, this platform is set for all of my scrapers, the tiniest ones for my hollowing, all the way up to the big ones. I don't move it a bit. It stays there. Every time I go back, it's going to hit it the same. I'm going to pinch my thumb and forefinger here just to keep it on. Orange sparks. I don't even look at it after, afterwards usually because it's always consistent. I can see it's sharpened and I'm back on the, the lathe. Um, I think that there is an advantage to... Um, 
I, I would make sure I round completely down away on this edge and round this edge too. This actually has a little tiny point on there, which I shouldn't have, but uh, points are hazardous. And if you really don't need them, then get them out of the way. Bob. Some people I've seen have done it where they've actually put a negative angle on the platform sure. and sharpen it upside down to sure. get a bigger burr on the top. Is right. that dangerous or is that a, an okay practice? No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's dangerous. Um, uh, the question was uh, turning it upside down and putting a bevel on the top for a, a negative rake. So um, you can buy... Scrapers, okay, we'll get into the use thing. Scrapers are pretty hazardous when you, uh, if you, let's just see what happens here. I'm going to get twisted around here. And maybe I'm better off up on top. You want to do that just for a second? Let's try up on top here. Is that, can you find me there? So scrapers are best used, um, held in a negative position. That is the handle elevated and the tool slightly down. So-called negative rake. Um, you, they can get really catchy if you have them upright, especially up like this. Again, you want to, you're, you're doing a scraping, you're not doing a cut, you don't want to jam into them. So just holding them in the middle of the piece at a negative angle, it works fine. And I, all of the, all of mine are that way. My Halloween ones, I have a little negative, you know, angle to them. So that's, uh, that's using a flat scraper at a negative rake. So you can buy scrapers that have a negative rake ground into them, or as Bob mentioned, you can turn a bevel on the top to make a negative rake. So you can hold this straight and it goes down at, a, at an angle. Um, I, I, think it's, I, think it, um, I think it adds a little Mickey Mouse and around myself when it comes to sharpening because you've got a bevel coming in two directions, like this particular one, I, I, I over time change the shape of it to bring it down more so that it fits the inside of bowls a little bit better. I change the shape. With the second bevel, I'd have to make sure that that second bevel was done at the same, at the same amount so that the, so that the existing cutting bevel would be level here. You've got to keep both those grinds even. Um, and so uh, to me, it, it, it's not helpful. I just, I just hold them negative and it works fine for me. I realize the convenience maybe of having a negative rake. Um, but yes, you know, so to sharpen, I guess to, to answer Bob's question, once that top rake if that top rake is pretty big it probably would last you for years and you probably could get away just with with cutting with sharpening the bottom for a long long time okay so um that's um that's that uh the next one is the um is just sharpening with um sharpening gouges using a v-arm and a jig. So <clears throat> what um, I did a lot of playing around with this. I made quite a few jigs for a lot of different tools that I, ha that I had. Then that was a lot of Mickey Mouse and around. And I finally figured out, well, hey, look at this is a, I've got a, um, an angle on my jig that I can fix and I'm comfortable with that. I'm not going to be messing around and changing this angle. It's consistent. Um, the, the distance measured from the tip of the tool um, to the jig uh, is constant. The commercial ones you get will give you a certain, you know, 
amount you use there. So that's the, the distance there is constant. I decided to make this constant down here. And so the only adjustment uh, on this, this whole rig here then is um, the length of the arm. And I use this, I use this gouge 75% of the time. So a lot of my sharpening, I don't, it's, my, my arm is already there. It's ready to go. And this is another one that I don't like the idea of having to adjust for different tools and, and this one's that way, this one's that way. So I, I made it like this for the common one that I had. And again, when it's time to come down off the lathe and sharpen it, uh, takes a few seconds to put this in, turn it on, and this this is actually for my chop saw. I kind of ran into this over here, so you don't want to do that. But that's it. I, I do that, and then I end, and I back up onto the tool, so it's easy. So then what about the different angles then? Well, it turned out that uh, this is about a 40-degree 40, uh, 40 angle I've got on the gouge I normally use. Um, but I've got a gouge here somewhere that is um, for getting d deep down in the bowls that's more like 55 degrees. What about that? Well, I found that all I had to do, the only adjustment I had to make was um, in this V arm, and I still came out just right. So um, I got this coated as a blue, so I, I, un I loosened the V arm and just used this as a, to measure the distance between the V arm and the um, grinder. Tighten it up. I put it in the same jig, the same distance. Everything else is consistent, and bam, I got a 55 degree. And um, I've got a. I commonly use. Um, well, I won't get into tool use, but I've got about a 30 degree spindle gouge. That um, some people say 30 degrees. Well, for doing longitude on these vases. I'll use a I'll use my bowl gouge that is a scraper to get it coarse, and then I'll blend it into, you know, using this bowl gouge to get the rough shapes. When I want to do the final shapes and get the flow going longitudinally on one of those, I like this 30 degree, uh, where um, so I'm working more uh, longitudinally along the piece. So 30 degree, um, yellow. yellow length there. And I kind of happened into this just because I had all of these gouges and I wanted to simplify it. And um, so that's, that's basically uh, the gouge sharpening thing. Um, oh, I'll point out. One, one I'm going to call it fault, that I see lots of people do with gouges, and I've seen it just all over the place, is that um, this, if you look here, um, in particular at this angle right here, I, I don't have, there is not a point up here. And that's because, this is the so-called fingernail grind, that's because I've, I don't know if you noticed, but I wrapped this thing darn near upside down here. So I rolled it, I rolled it over um, on, the, um, on the grinder to eliminate that point up there that is hazardous. And I see this lots of times on gouges like, well, I've been there before. I know what those points do. You get them in the wrong spot and uh, it'll catch and blow the thing. Well, this rounds it and just get, get it out of the way. So go upside down to roll that in. And instead of stopping, and lots of people stop on the side edge and then it ends up being really flat. 
flat and sharp. And that's just more, that's a danger. Uh, I'll just make a comment on uh, some, uh, oh, Beatty or Batty, Stuart Batty or whoever it is is promoting this 40-40 grind. And I've got, I've got a 40 on the end here on my favorite one. The 40-40 basically um, puts it on the grinder and, um, and ends up uh, doing it 40 degrees all the way around so that you've got a 40 degree cut all around for uniformity. And to me it's like, well I've got a 40 degree on the end, I don't really have to have one out here. What you're missing if you don't use these, you know, a standard, um, a standard jig is that, and if you look at these, the tip is 40, but it changes and it comes all the way around to a, you know, a 50, 60, 70 degree turn, uh, angle up here. So in the use of this sort of thing, I, I wouldn't want the 40, 40, because I want these, these variations that is built into this type of uh, jig. Um, you, can, you can change what your tool is doing, the angle that you're hitting, by just twisting the tool a little bit. You can crank it down where you get much more of a sheer, fine cut, um, just with the, with the twist. And that's on the push as well as the pull cut. So having, having this rolled over edge where you can't catch it, and having the standard jig for uh, doing this, and, and uh, having a nice gradual rollover without a flat edge, uh, allows you a huge variability in turning as you're going. And you can do some, you know, difficult, you can do a, go from a 40, but right on up to something a lot finer both ways. So there's a lot of variability this way. So I, I don't like the 40 40 thing. Um, it's just my personal thing. Um, oh, another deal you'll see are the, uh, the Raptor. Oh, to, 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 to get the distance on the, to, to get the angle on the on the V arm, Raptor has a little gadget that will fit up against the the uh, wheel and down here, and you can then tighten it up to where you need it, right? Um, and then you take that out. Well, when you have it tightened down, why is that any different than this right here? I can measure that same distance here with this that you can with a Raptor setup, putting it in there. So to me, that's a, I don't, that's a, um, it's just not necessary. And it's, it's, you're fiddling around a little bit more. Yes? How did you find the initial, how did you find the initial length uh, then of those measuring pieces? Um, I don't know if there's, how, we're, are we doing kind of poorly for time? <clears throat> okay. Um, first of all, you can use a commercial rig. Uh, let me quickly describe what, this kind of will answer your question, I think. Let me try to quickly describe what you do when you have a favorite, um, tool here and you want to figure out what these settings ought to be on your jig and the whole thing. Um, little jig. Okay, here we go. I'll try to do this quickly. Uh, so I, I know nothing about, I've got, a, I've got a jig here out of the box, but I've got a tool that I want to reproduce. How do I, how do, I do this? Um, we know nothing here. This is just there, there, and there. Okay, what you do is you this is one of these ones that I made that's just for smaller uh, diameters. Let me okay, we'll try this. Okay, so um, you do this you do like the, you know, you have your given, you figure out what the commercial distance is. I think it's one and three quarters inches. Some of them are different. But you get a fixed one three quarters inches. But now, I don't know where this goes, and I don't know where this goes. Well, what you do is you start off, 
and you you just um, get the get the front bevel. I'll stand out of the way here. You get the front bevel um, set related to the tilt of the, uh, at the tilt of the jig uh, on this axis. So this this is going to control the front edge. So we get front edge. I'm going to put it up there. Okay, it looks even. That looks good. I'm going to tighten it up here because I'm in a hurry. I'll just do the best I can here. To okay, got her about right. Okay, now I want a side grind the same as this tool here too. So I'm going to come over here and the side grind, okay, that's off. So I'm going to end up moving that up to where it, okay, my side grind is looking good right there now. But that little tweak down there of that V-arm did alter the front angle just a bit. So we come back to the front angle. Yeah, not, the front angle's off a little bit. Okay, that's all right. It's, it's a small adjustment, but I'm going to readjust that now so that it is, okay, it's on target now. Okay, now we're going to recheck the side grind. Uh, that might need a little adjustment. Okay, that way, just a little fraction of an inch. And let's go back here. Man, well, yeah, okay, I get it. Tiny, tiny bit. Okay, I, I'm, I'm done here. Okay, so I have my jig now that is rigged up for this tool. And I have the distance here. That's the important thing here. So if... Um, if you want to make this, you know, you, you can mark this or you can tighten it down and never loosen it and use that for your other tools. You, but you want to right now, before you move this V-arm any, you want to get a good little measurement of that. I use these old files. I cut them down to where they're just scraping the, just scraping the, the um, wheel. So... That's that's how you do it, and um, so I can now take this off, and now you could do, hey, right. I got a different tool here. I'm, right. I'm going to put that in and do it. Would it be okay if people have more questions if they could stay and? Sure. We usually try to end between eight thirty and quarter till nine. Sure. Yep. And That'd be uh, fine. If some mm -hmm. people want to leave now, we'll I thank you all for coming tonight, and be sure and stay and ask Ray some more questions if you have any, or any of the other club members. So thank you all for coming tonight. Hope to see you next month. Thank you.